Ryan died in 1990 at the age of 18. He also made a difference with the Ryan White character. What if the stars you adored were hiding a deadly secret? Discover the untold stories of 50 celebrities whose lives were tragically cut short by HIV AIDS. Their legacies will shock you. Number 50, Freddie Mercury. Imagine a voice so powerful, it defined an era. Born Farouk Bolsara in the Sultanate of Zanzibar, Freddie Mercury is globally celebrated for his exceptional talent and charisma. He moved to England at a young age, where he studied art and design at Enling Art College in London. This education would later influence many of Queen's album covers that he designed himself. In 1970, Mercury teamed up with Brian May and Roger Taylor to form the rock band Queen, which soon became an international sensation. Mercury's distinctive voice had a remarkable range that spanned over four octaves. His flamboyant stage presence and powerful vocals made him one of the most beloved entertainers in rock music history. As the primary lyricist for Queen, Mercury penned numerous hits including Bohemian Rhapsody, Killer Queen, Somebody to Love, and We Are the Champions. These songs not only top charts during their time, but continue to be classics even today. Despite his early demise due to complications from AIDS at the age of 45 in 1991, Mercury remains an iconic figure in popular culture. His life was immortalized on screen through the biopic Bohemian Rhapsody, which won multiple awards worldwide. Today, Freddie Mercury continues to inspire millions with his music legacy, a testament to his unparalleled contribution as a musician, performer, and cultural icon. The flamboyant front man for the band Queen kept quiet about his HIV status until the day before his death from AIDS-related bronchial pneumonia in November 1991. In a final public statement, he wrote, I felt it correct to keep this information private to date in order to protect the privacy of those around me. However, the time has now come for my friends and fans around the world to know the truth and I hope that everyone will join with me, my doctors, and all those worldwide in the fight against this terrible disease. Well, Freddie Mercury confirmed at the weekend that he had AIDS, and he died last night at the age of 45. Number 49, Rudolf Nureyev. What happens when an artist's greatest fear becomes reality? The dancer who defected from the Soviet Union in 1961 denied having HIV. But his doctor, Michael Kanazi, confirmed that Nureyev's death resulted from AIDS. Kanazi told Paris's Le Figaro that the dancer was afraid to reveal his illness because it might limit his career. Nureyev was diagnosed in 1984. Kanazi was treating him for pericarditis and inflammation of the membrane around the heart when Nureyev died in January 1993. When AIDS appeared in France's news around 1992, Nureyev took little notice. The dancer tested positive for AIDS in 1984, but for several years he simply denied that anything was wrong with his health. However, by the late 1980s, his diminished capabilities disappointed his admirers who had fond memories of his outstanding prowess and skill. Nureyev began a marked decline only in the summer of 1991 and entered the final phase of the disease in the spring of 1992. Number 48, Robert Reed. What happens when Hollywood's dad hides a dark secret? Robert Reed was an American actor. He played Kenneth Preston on the legal drama The Defenders from 1961 to 1965 alongside E.G. Marshall. The Shakespearean trained actor appeared on Broadway in Neil Simon's Barefoot in the Park, but he became America's dad in 1969 when he was cast as Mike Brady, the father of three sons, in a blended family known as the Brady Bunch. He later reprised his role of Mike Brady on several of the reunion programs. In 1976, he earned two Primetime Emmy Award nominations for his guest starring role in a two-part episode of Medical Center and for his work on the miniseries Rich Man, Poor Man. The following year, Reed earned a third Emmy nomination for his role in the miniseries Roots. Reed, who was gay, hid his sexuality during his decades in Hollywood since public knowledge of his true sexual orientation during that era would likely have damaged his career. 
Several years after his death, Reed's Brady Bunch co-star, notably Barry Williams and Florence Henderson, publicly acknowledged Reed's sexual orientation and revealed that the entire cast and crew of the Brady Bunch were aware of it. His death, originally contributed to colon cancer, was later found to have been hastened by AIDS. Number 47, Tom Villard. The courage to speak out when others stayed silent. Thomas Lewis Villard, November 19, 1953 to November 14, 1994, was an American actor. He is known for his leading role in the 1980s series, We Got It Made, as well as roles in feature films, One Crazy Summer, Heartbreak Ridge, My Girl, and Popcorn. Toward the end of his life, Villard became one of the few actors in Hollywood in the early 1990s who chose to open about his homosexuality and the challenge of living with HIV and AIDS. In February 1994, Villard made an unprecedented appearance on Entertainment Tonight, acknowledging to more than 13 million viewers that he was gay, that he had AIDS, and that he needed some help. On November 14, 1994, five days shy of his 41st birthday, Villard died of AIDS-related pneumonia. Number 46, Halston. A fashion icon whose legacy still influences style today. The revered fashion designer style was known as being minimalist. That's the way fashion is made, not through the press, not through designers or anything else. It's made for people. And the designer often used cashmere and ultra suede. His most famous clients were Jackie Onassis, Andy Warhol, and Liza Minnelli. He was also a figure of 70s nightlife in New York and was a staple at the famed Disco Studio 54. His longtime love was rumored to be widow dresser Victor Hugo. Halston died in 1990 in San Francisco of Kaposi's sarcoma and AIDS-related cancer. Number 45, Kevin Peter Hall. The towering figure who brought iconic characters to life. Kevin Peter Hall, May 9, 1955 to April 10, 1991, was an American actor best known for his roles as the title character in the first two films in the Predator franchise. I am Predator, master of the universe. And the title character of Harry in the film and television series, Harry and the Hendersons. He also appeared in the television series Misfits of Science and 227, along with the film Without Warning. Most people think that when you prepare for a role for this, it's mostly just physical. It's mostly just jogging and push-ups and movement, and all of that's very important. Endurance is very important to be inside a suit. It's very hot, and it's uh, really rough work. But there was also a lot of thought into what kind of movement, what kind of... Uh, planet he came from. While working on the TV series Harry and the Hendersons, Hall announced that he had contracted HIV from a blood transfusion during surgery for injuries he sustained in a car accident. He died from AIDS-related pneumonia on April 10, 1991, a month short of his 36th birthday. Number 44, Brad Davis. A star who bravely took on roles others feared this actor found fame as one of the stars of the unflinching film Midnight Express. Which told the story of Americans tortured in a Turkish prison. Davis, who was straight, was respected for having the courage to take on gay roles, specifically in Larry Kramer's play, The Normal Heart, and the film Corel. Before becoming sober, Davis used intravenous drugs, which he and his wife believed were responsible for his infection. Davis tested positive for HIV in 1985, but kept it quiet until shortly before his death at age 41, on September 8, 1991, so he wouldn't be blacklisted in Hollywood. Number 43, Kenny Everett, the man behind the voice that defined British radio. You should be more careful, Michael. You're overdoing it. <laughs> Whatever it is you do. Personally, I don't like diets. Oh, I'm carrying a few extra pounds here and there. But they're, they're balanced, you know what I mean? <laughs> Kenny Everett, December 25th, 1994 to April 4th, 1995, was a British comedian and radio disc jockey known for his irreverent, offbeat, comedic style and easygoing personality. 
After spells on pirate radio and Radio Luxembourg in the mid-1960s, he was one of the first DJs to join BBC Radio's newly created Radio One in 1967. It was here he developed his trademark voices and surreal characters, which he later adapted for TV. Everett was dismissed from the BBC in 1970 after making remarks about a government minister's wife. He returned to commercial radio when it became licensed in the UK and joined Capital Radio. Starring in the late 1960s, he's transitioned to television, where he made numerous comedy series on ITV and BBC, often appearing with Cleo Roccos, whose glamorous and curvaceous figure was often used to comic effect. If there's one thing I will not tolerate, it is double entendre. If there's one in the show, I'm having it off. <laughs> when I say I'm having it off, I mean I'm not having it. You may say I've got an obsession about double entendres. Well, I admit it, I've got a big one. <laughs> Everett was a politically right-of-center media star who openly supported the British Conservative Party and made publicity appearances at conferences and rallies. However, as a gay man, he faced criticism for supporting the UK Conservative government after it had enacted Section 28, a clause of the Local Government Act which allowed councils to opt out of promoting homosexual issues. Everett was a highly versatile performer, able to write his own scripts, compose jingles, and operate advanced recording and mixing equipment. His personality also made him a regular guest on chat shows and panel programs like Blankety Blank. He was diagnosed with HIV in 1989 and died in 1995 has died today from an AIDS-related illness. He was 50. Everett became one of the best-known faces on British television, with his comedy show featuring characters such as Sid Snot and the drag star Cupid Stunt. Our show business correspondent Ken Andrew looks back on Everett's career and his battle against AIDS. Number 42, John Curry. A figure skater who combined artistry with athleticism. John Anthony Curry, September 9, 1949 to April 15, 1994, was a British figure skater. He was the 1976 Olympic and world champion. He was noted for combining ballet and modern dance influences into his skating. I felt that this year winning was uh, really a great mark in the acceptance of what I've been trying to do with my skating. My skating has been criticized a great deal over the years because of the artistic element. It is speculated that Curry was outed as gay by a German tabloid newspaper, Bild Zeitung, before the March 1976 World Championships. Curry confirmed he was gay at a press conference in Innsbruck the same evening. It caused a brief scandal in Europe at the time, but Curry's sexual orientation was generally ignored by the press and public for many years afterward. In 1987, Curry was diagnosed with HIV and in 1991 with AIDS. He spent the last years of his life with his mother. He died from an AIDS-related heart attack on April 15, 1994 at age 44. Number 41, Derek Jarman, an artist who pushed boundaries and redefined cinema. This forward-thinking British director shook up cinema in the 1970s, 80s, and 90s. Jarman's gay theme, politically driven work took on everything from the monarchy to Shakespeare classics to the scourge of AIDS. His cinematic style could be described as experimental, but it always came with a strong opinion and a definitive point. Jarman's Edward II is seen by many scholars as a modern classic, and it helped propel actress Tilda Swinton to stardom. Jarman never hid his sexuality or his HIV diagnosis, which would fail him in 1994. I have AIDS, and I have made four feature films <laughs> since I discovered I was HIV, and I'm going to make at least two next year, and I've written three books. Number 40, Easy e the voice of gangsta rap who left us too soon. I just feel that I've got thousands and thousands of young fans that have to learn about what's real when it comes to AIDS. I would like to turn my own problem into something good that will reach out to all my homeboys and their kin. Easy e born as Eric Lynn Wright on September 7, 1964, made his mark in the world of hip-hop music. 
A Compton-born artist achieved fame as a rapper, record producer, and entrepreneur, ultimately earning recognition as one of the founding fathers of gangsta rap. The audacious character Easy es life was characterized by his constant defiance of societal norms, which resonated through his music, impacting an entire generation. His experiences led to the formation of Ruthless Records, a label that provided an outlet for artists who adopted a grittier, more authentic approach to hip-hop. The record label achieved monumental success with acts like N.W.A., a groundbreaking group that included Easy e himself, Dr. Dre, Ice Cube, MC Ren, and DJ Yella. N.W.A.'s explicit lyrics and raw portrayal of street life in their music significantly shaped the direction of hip-hop culture. Easy es impact on music was cut short when he tragically passed away on March 26, 1995, just a few weeks after learning he had AIDS. He didn't say how he got it, but he told the LA Times, I have seven children with six different mothers. Maybe success was too good to me. His wife, whom he married just before his death, and his infant son didn't get the virus. I have never believed the official story of my father's death. I have always believed that something else happened, and I'm afraid of what that might be. Number 39, Dak Rambo. The soap opera star with a secret that shocked Hollywood. Norman J. Rambo, professionally known as Dak Rambo, was an American actor, most notable for appearing as Walter Brennan's grandson, Jeff, in the series The Guns of Will Sonnet, as Steve Jacoby in the soap opera All My Children, as Cousin Jack Ewing in Dallas, and as Grant Harrison in the soap opera Another World. For most of his life, Rambo was closeted about his bisexuality. He later said that he had been bisexual for most of his life and had a spicy sex life that never included safe sex. Rambo learned that he was HIV positive on August 30, 1991, while preparing to tape scenes for Another World. After finishing work, he told the producers that he had HIV and that he wished to leave the show. He never returned to acting. Rambo issued a press release on October 1, 1991, publicly disclosing his serial conversion status. Dak Rambo died on March 21, 1994, at the age of 52, of complications from AIDS. Number 38, Amanda Blake. TV's beloved Miss Kitty carried a heartbreaking secret. Better known to TV fans as Miss Kitty on the 1960s TV show Gunsmoke, Blake became the first well-known actress to die from AIDS. Her original cause of death was listed as oral cancer, but her doctor later said she died from liver failure brought on by AIDS-related hepatitis. She was diagnosed in 1988 a year before her August 1989 death. Friends believe she got the virus from her ex-husband, Mark Spieth, a Texas developer who died of AIDS in 1985. You're exhausted. Why don't you go in and try and get some sleep? I can't. Well, try. Besides, it's better if we're not together if the police come. I'm all right, Gretchen. Helen, don't worry. In 1977, Blake, who was a heavy cigarette smoker, developed oral cancer that was successfully treated with surgery. She became a supporter of the American Cancer Society and made fundraising appearances throughout the country. In 1984, she was the recipient of the Society's Annual Courage Award, which was presented to her by then U.S. President Ronald Reagan. On August 16, 1989, Blake died of AIDS-related pneumonia at Mercy General Hospital in Sacramento, California at the age of 60. Her death was initially attributed to throat cancer, but after her death, her doctor publicly announced her death was due to complications from AIDS. It is not known how Blake contracted the disease. Blake's close friends insisted that she was not a drug user or sexually promiscuous. Number 37, Peter Allen, an Oscar-winning songwriter who kept his pain hidden. This Australian import was best known for his Oscar-winning song, Arthur's Theme. 
written in collaboration with others, and for serving as songwriter for Olivia Newton-John, Carly Simon, and Frank Sinatra, to name only a few. Allen, discovered by Judy Garland, later married her daughter, Liza Minnelli, but the couple parted ways after seven years. After their divorce, Allen came out and lived with his long-term partner, model Gregory Connell, until Connell's death from an AIDS-related illness in 1984. Allen died in 1992 from AIDS-related throat cancer. Hugh Jackman would later star in a musical about Allen's life, The Boy from Oz. His patriotic song, I Can Still Call Australia Home, has been used extensively in advertising campaigns and was added to the National Film and Sound Archive's Sounds of Australia Registry in 2013. Number 36, Howard Ashman. The man who gave Disney classics their soul, Howard Elliott Ashman, was an American playwright and lyricist. He collaborated with Alan Menken on several works and is most widely known for several animated feature films from Disney for which Ashman wrote the lyrics and Mencken composed the music. Ashman and Mencken began their collaboration with the musical God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater, 1979, for which Ashman directed and wrote both book and lyrics. Their next musical, Little Shop of Horrors, 1982, for which Ashman again directed and wrote both book and lyrics, became a long-running success and led to the 1986 feature film, the partnership's first Disney film was The Little Mermaid, 1989, followed by Beauty and the Beast, 1991. After his death, some of Ashman's songs were included in another Disney film, Aladdin, 1992. Ashman was diagnosed with HIV AIDS in January 1988 during the production of The Little Mermaid as he continued to write songs. Peter Coons noted that Ashman was supported by Jeffrey Katzenberg, Disney created a production unit near his home in Beacon, New York, allowing him to continue working on Beauty and the Beast while undergoing treatment at the St. Vincent's Catholic Medical Center in New York City. Ashman died at St. Vincent's on March 14, 1991 at the age of 40, prior to the film's completion. Beauty and the Beast was dedicated to his memory, featuring the message after the end credits to our friend Howard, who gave a mermaid her voice and a beast his soul. We will be forever grateful. Howard Ashman, 1950 to 1991. Number 35, Keith Haring. An artist who turned his work into a message of hope. Keith Allen Haring was an American artist whose pop art and graffiti-like work grew out of the New York City street culture of the 1980s. Haring's work grew to popularity from his spontaneous drawings in New York City subways chalk out lines of figures, dogs, and other stylized images on blank black advertising space backgrounds. After public recognition, he created larger scale works such as colorful murals, many of them commissioned. His imagery has become a widely recognized visual language. His later work often addressed political and societal themes, especially homosexuality and AIDS, through his own iconography. As his career grew, so did his advocacy for AIDS-related causes. He was diagnosed in 1988 and established the Keith Haring Foundation in 1989 to provide art and money for AIDS organizations and children's programs. He died of AIDS-related complications in February 1990. Number 34, Gia Karanji, the first supermodel whose life spiraled out of control. Karanji has been dubbed the world's first supermodel having appeared on the cover of four international editions of Vogue, in five editions of Cosmopolitan, and in advertisements for Armani, Versace, and Christian Dior, all before turning 23. Gee, when you got out here being photographed, you not only looked different, you acted different. You became a different individual. What's the process? I mean, you, when you're having your photograph taken do you think of yourself in a different way as you project to the camera? Uh, I have to. It's, you know, that's what I do. It's a job. I mean, I'm modeling. So I have to project what I am. She openly loved women 
having flings with female photographers, makeup artists, and designers. Karachi spent most of her modeling earnings on drugs and spent the final three years of her life with various lovers, friends, and family members in Philadelphia and Atlantic City, New Jersey. She was admitted to an intense drug treatment program in Eagleville Hospital in December 1984. After treatment, she got a job in a clothing store, which she eventually quit. She later found employment as a checkout clerk and then worked in the cafeteria of a nursing home. By late 1985, she had begun using drugs again and was engaging in prostitution in Atlantic City. Sadly, at 26, Karachi became one of the first famous women to die of AIDS-related complications, having reportedly contracted it through injection drug use. HBO Films later paid tribute with an Emmy-winning 1998 drama, Gia, starring up-and-comer Angelina Jolie. Number 33, Klaus Nomi an otherworldly performer taken too soon. Klaus Sperber, better known as Klaus Nomi, was a German countertenor noted for his wide vocal range and an unusual otherworldly stage persona. Nomi was known for his bizarrely visionary theatrical live performances, heavy makeup, unusual costumes, and a highly styled signature hairdo that flaunted a receding hairline. His songs were equally unusual, ranging from synthesized laden interpretations of classical opera to covers of 1960s pop standards like Chubby Checkered's The Twist and Lou Christie's Lightning Strikes. When I settle down, I want one baby on my mind. The German performer remains adored thanks to his highly original performances, beautiful singing voice and trend-setting costumes. After becoming a sensation in his native country, Nomi won over the crowds at various New York City nightclubs during the end of the disco era. He sang backup for David Bowie on Saturday Night Live, influenced drag legend Joey Arias, and even appeared in films. Sadly, in 1983, Nomi became one of the first celebrities to die of AIDS complications. Number 32, Pedro Zamora. A reality TV icon who made HIV AIDS visible, Pedro Pablo Zamora was a Cuban-American AIDS educator and television personality. As one of the first openly gay men with AIDS to be portrayed in popular media, Zamora brought international attention to HIV AIDS and LGBT issues and prejudices through his appearance on MTV's reality TV series, The Real World, San Francisco. Zamora's romantic relationship with Sean Sasser was also documented on the show their relationship was later nominated by MTV viewers for the Favorite Love Story Award, and the broadcast of their commitment ceremony in which they exchanged vows was the first such same-sex ceremony in television history and is considered a landmark in the history of the medium. I feel a connection or a closeness to Pedro that I have to anyone else in such a short period of time. And I don't know what that has to do with, but... I know one thing's for sure, I don't want it to go away. <laughs> he was diagnosed in 1989 at 17 and quickly became an advocate for HIV prevention and care, visiting churches and schools to educate kids about transmission and hand out condoms. In November 1994, one day after the season finale aired, he died at age 22 from progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. Number 31, Lance Loud. The first reality TV star whose coming out shocked the nation. Loud became part of one of the world's first reality shows when PBS aired An American Family in 1973. Lance, the eldest son of the Loud family, came out to an estimated 10 million viewers during the second episode and changed the television landscape forever. But, uh, one thing that's been made clear to her now, even though she still denies it, is that I am 21 and I'm not only Lance Loud, son of um, Blondie Day, um, Pat and Bill Loud, but uh, I'm more or less 21 years old and a person. Later, Loud moved from California to New York formed a band called The Mumps, and eventually settled into his status as a gay icon. Loud died in 2001 of liver failure caused by hepatitis C and HIV. 
In 2011, HBO Films made Cinema Verite, a film about the making of the original PBS documentary series, starring Diane Lane, Tim Robbins, James Gandolfini, and Thomas Decker as Lance. Number 30, Sylvester. A disco legend whose voice still resonates today. Disco legend Sylvester James, known simply as Sylvester, was a legendary singer and songwriter from San Francisco, known for his signature song, You Make Me Feel Mighty Real, and for his flamboyant appearance and falsetto singing voice. Sylvester died in 1988 from AIDS-related complications. Sylvester left royalties from his music to the AIDS Emergency Fund and to Rita Rocket's food program at San Francisco General Hospital's Ward 86 for people diagnosed with AIDS. The year of his death, Sylvester was working on his third studio album, knowing that he may very well never be able to release it. Number 29, James Kirkwood Jr. The Pulitzer winning playwright with a hidden struggle. James Kirkwood Jr. was an American playwright, author, and actor. In 1976, he received a Tony Award, the Drama Desk Award for Outstanding Book of a Musical, and the Pulitzer Prize for Drama for the Broadway hit A Chorus Line. From 1953 to 1957, he played Mickey Emerson on the soap opera Valiant Lady. Once again, we say hello to Jim Kirkwood and Lee Goodman. <laughs> Kirkwood wrote the autobiographical novel There Must Be a Pony, made into a TV film starring Elizabeth Taylor and Robert Wagner. In 1959, Kirkwood appeared on Perry Mason as Johnny Baylor, son of Senator Harriman Baylor, in the case of the Footloose Doll. Kirkwood died in his Manhattan apartment of AIDS-related complications in 1989. Number 28, Lee Bowery, the avant-garde fashion icon who lived and performed on his own terms. An Australian performer, artist, club promoter, and fashion designer, Bowery was known for his conceptual, flamboyant, and outlandish costumes and makeup, as well as his sometimes controversial live performances. Hello, remember me, Lee Bowery. Would you like to come into my dressing room? The jacket you're looking at is rather interesting in that the gold fringe is made from Kirby grips. Based in London for much of his adult life, he was a significant model and muse for the English painter Lucian Freud. Bowery's friend and fellow performer, Boy George, said he saw Bowery's outrageous performances a number of times and that it never ceased to impress or revolt. Although Bowery was openly gay, he married his longtime female companion, Nicola Bateman, on May 13, 1994, in Tower Hamlets, London, in a personal art performance. Although he had been HIV positive for six years, very few of those who knew him guessed that. He typically explained his public absence by saying he had gone to Papua New Guinea. His wife did not know that Bowery had HIV until he was admitted to the hospital in late November 1994. He died seven months after their marriage on New Year's Eve, 1994. The date has been disrupted by his father, who says he actually died in the early hours of New Year's Day, 1995, from an AIDS-related illness at the Middlesex Hospital, Westminster, London, five weeks after his admission. Lucy and Freud paid for Bowery's body to be repatriated to Australia. Number 27, Michael Jeter a beloved character actor who brought joy despite his struggles. Just think of it, all the movies you'll watch are free now, dramas, westerns, comedies, wow! Video Spot has the best selection. If you like porno, we're your connection. And everything's coming up, video! Michael Jeter was an American actor and comedian. Known for his career on stage and screen, Jeter played diverse characters, taking on roles ranging from eccentric to pretentious to weak and ineffectual. He won a Tony Award and a Primetime Emmy Award. He portrayed Herman Stiles on the sitcom Evening Shade from 1990 until 1994. Jeter gained fame for his roles in The Fisher King 1991 and The Green Mile 1999. Jeter was gay and met his partner, Sean Blue, in 1995. They were together until Jeter's death in 2003. Blue died in 2020 in a motorcycle accident. 
Jeter was HIV positive and disclosed his diagnosis in a 1997 interview on Entertainment Tonight. Despite this, he remained healthy for many years. On March 30, 2003, Jeter was found dead by Blue at his home in Hollywood Hills, California. He was 50 years old. Blue said that Jeter died of complications after an epileptic seizure. Number 26. Ian Charlson A Shakespearean actor who went out on his own terms. Ian Charlson was a Scottish stage and film actor. He is best known internationally for his starring role as Olympic athlete and missionary Eric Lindell in the Oscar-winning 1981 film Chariots of Fire. He is also well known for his portrayal of Reverend Charlie Andrews in the 1982 Oscar-winning film Gandhi. Charlson was a noted actor on the British stage as well, with critically acclaimed leads in Guys and Dolls, Cat on a Hot Tin Roof, Fool for Love, and Hamlet, among many others. He performed numerous Shakespearean roles, and in 1991, the annual Ian Charleston Awards were established, particularly in honor of his final Hamlet. The awards reward the best classical stage performances in Britain by actors aged under 30. The Hoden Mifflin Dictionary of Biography describes Charlson as a leading player of charm and power, and one of the finest British actors of his generation. Alan Bates wrote that Charlson was definitely among the top 10 actors of his age group. Ian McKellen said Charlson was the most unmannered and unactor-ish of actors. Always truthful, always honest. Charlson was diagnosed with HIV in 1986 and died in 1990 at the age of 40. He requested that it be announced after his death that he had died of AIDS in order to publicize the condition. This was the first celebrity death in the United Kingdom openly attributed to AIDS, and the announcement helped to promote awareness and acceptance of the disease. Number 25. Ryan White The Boy Who Changed America's View on HIV-AIDS Ryan Wayne White was an American teenager from Kokomo, Indiana, who became a national poster child for HIV-AIDS in the United States after failing to be readmitted to school following a diagnosis of AIDS. What do you want? You know what I want! What do you want? You know what I want, Mommy! You want to go to school? Yes! I want to go to school! As a hemophiliac, he became infected with HIV from a contaminated Factor VIII blood treatment and, when diagnosed in December 1984, was given six months to live. Doctors said he posed no risk to other students, as AIDS is not an airborne disease and spreads solely through body fluids, but AIDS was poorly understood by the general public at the time. When White tried to return to school, many parents and teachers in Howard County rallied against his attendance due to concerns of the disease spreading through bodily fluid transfer. A lengthy administrative appeal process ensued. The news of the conflict turned Ryan into a popular celebrity and advocate for AIDS research and public education. Surprising his doctors, Ryan White lived five years longer than predicted. He died on April 8, 1990, one month before his high school graduation. Ryan died in 1990 at the age of 18. He also made a difference with the Ryan White Care Act, which provides treatment and medication for people living with HIV. During the 1980s, AIDS was largely stigmatized as an illness impacting the gay community because it was first diagnosed among gay men. In the USA, that perception shifted with the media focus placed on Ryan and other prominent straight HIV-infected people, such as Magic Johnson, Arthur Ashe, and the Ray Brothers, although these cases were often framed as innocent against gay men who were seen as guilty subjects. The U.S. Congress passed a major piece of AIDS legislation, the Ryan White Care Act, shortly after White's death. The act has been reauthorized twice. Ryan White programs are the largest provider of services for people living with HIV AIDS in the United States. Number 24, Arthur Russell, a musical genius whose talent was lost too soon. Keep it up, Arthur Russell was an American celloist, composer, producer, singer, and musician from Iowa. 
whose work spanned a disparate range of styles. Trained in contemporary experimental composition and Indian classical music in the mid-1970s, he relocated to New York, where he became associated with Lower Manhattan's avant-garde community, as well as the city's disco scene. Throughout the 70s and 80s, Russell produced a considerable collection of material, including several underground dance hits under aliases such as Dinosaur L and Indian Ocean. But his near inability to complete projects resulted in a limited amount of released output. World of Echo 1986 was his only solo pop album to be released during his life. He died of AIDS-related illnesses in 1992, still in relative obscurity and nearly broke. Throughout the 2000s, a series of reissues, compilations, books, and a biographical documentary significantly raised his profile. Number 23. Steve Rubel The man behind the legendary Studio 54. Brooklyn-born Rubel, along with business partner Ian Schwager, opened famed disco Studio 54 in 1977. The club was known for excess and as a place where everyday people could party with the beautiful ones. Just a few of the regulars were Andy Warhol, Liza Minnelli, Bianca Jagger, Halston, Calvin Klein, Truman Capote, Diana Ross, Madonna, and Cher. Top music stars of the 70s were also known to take the stage. The Village People, Donna Summer, and Gloria Gaynor all entertain revelers. After Rubel was convicted of tax evasion in 1979, nightclub watchers said the club scene in New York was never the same. Even though he was taking AZT, Rubel died in 1989 of AIDS complications, including hepatitis and septic shock. Number 22. Alvin Ailey A dance visionary who reshaped American culture Alvin Ailey, January 5, 1931 to December 1, 1989, was an African-American dancer, director, choreographer, and activist who founded the Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater, one of the most successful dance companies in the world. He created AAADT and its affiliated Ailey School as havens for nurturing black artists and expressing the universality of the African-American experience through dance. His work fused theater, modern dance, ballet, and jazz with black vernacular, creating hope-fueled choreography that continues to spread global awareness of black life in America. Ailey's choreographic masterpiece, Revelations, is recognized as one of the most popular and most performed ballets in the world. Ailey died from an AIDS-related illness on December 1, 1989, at the age of 58. He asked his doctor to announce that his death was caused by terminal blood dyscrasia in order to shield his mother from the stigma associated with HIV AIDS. Number 21, Tony Richardson, an award-winning director with a secret struggle. Cecil Antonio Richardson, June 5, 1928 to November 14, 1991, was an English theater and film producer, director, and screenwriter whose career spanned five decades. He was identified with the Angry Young Men group of British directors and playwrights during the 1950s and was later a key figure in the British New Wave filmmaking movement. His films, Look Back in Anger, 1959, The Entertainer, 1960, A Taste of Honey, 1961, and The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner, 1962, are considered classics of kitchen sink realism. He won the 1964 Academy Awards for Best Director and Best Picture for the film Tom Jones. The winner is Tony Richards for Tom Jones. He was also a two-time BAFTA award winner and was twice nominated for the Palm d'Or. With his wife Vanessa Redgrave, Richardson was the father of actress Natasha Richardson and Jolie Richardson. Number 20, Anthony Perkins, an actor who terrified audiences but lived with a hidden fear. Born in New York City on April 4, 1932, to stage actor Osgood Perkins and Janet Esselstein Rain, Perkins embarked on his acting career during the golden age of Hollywood, honing his craft at the Actors Studio. 
Initially, Perkins gained recognition for his compelling performances in stage productions, with his Broadway debut in Tea and Symphony, earning him a Theatre's World Award. His seamless transition to the silver screen further solidified his reputation as a versatile actor. Perkins' portrayal of charming yet troubled characters in films like Friendly Persuasion 1956 earned him an Academy Award nomination, demonstrating his ability to imbue complex psychological portraits with subtlety and sophistication. Perkins' most infamous role came in 1960 when he starred as the tormented motel owner Norman Bates in Psycho. His chilling performance not only defined his career, but also reshaped the landscape of horror cinema forever. Despite being typecast in similar roles thereafter, Perkins continued to deliver noteworthy performances in films like The Trial 1962 and Pretty Poison 1968. A gifted musician, Perkins also had a penchant for jazz music and released three pop albums during his career. He was diagnosed with HIV in the late 1980s. While he kept it a secret, he worked with Project Angel Food, which provided meals for homebound people with HIV. In a statement released shortly before his death, he said, There are many who believe that this disease is God's vengeance, but I believe it was sent to teach people how to love and understand and have compassion for each other. He passed away in September 1992, leaving behind a legacy that continues to inspire actors and filmmakers around the globe. 19. Andy Milligan A cult filmmaker who died in poverty and obscurity. Andy Milligan was an American playwright, screenwriter, actor, and filmmaker, whose work included 27 films made between 1965 and 1988. In spite of the fact that he directed a number of films that have become cult favorites with horror movie buffs, he died in abject poverty in 1991 from AIDS and was buried in an unmarked pauper's grave in Los Angeles, California. Milligan was openly gay, enjoyed S&M, and had very few long-term relationships, all of which were with men. One of his closest friends was a Vietnam vet, an ex-convict named Dennis Mavalsi who acted in Milligan's troupe theater in the late 1970s, early 1980s, and also worked for Milligan as a crew person, transportation driver, and even acted in one of Milligan's horror movies, Carnage, in 1983. Malvasi was a former U.S. Marine and demolition expert who was suspected in numerous abortion clinic bombings in New York State during the 1980s. In poor health from 1989, Milligan was diagnosed with AIDS some months after his lover, Keaton, died. He initially kept his condition a secret as he tried to continue working on writing stage play scripts and screenplays. Later, unable to find more financial backers, he eventually closed down his theater and production company, Troop West, in early 1990, and then completely withdrew from the public light altogether. In June 1990, Milligan confided in only two people the true nature of his health, friend and actor John Miranda and writer-biographer Jimmy Donahoe who then became his part-time caregivers for the next 12 months. Andy Milligan died in the early morning hours of June 3, 1991, from complications of AIDS at the Queen of Angels Hospital in Los Angeles, California, at age 62. He was buried in an unmarked grave somewhere in Los Angeles due to his poor financial situation at death. Number 18. Alexis Arquette a groundbreaking transgender actress who fought for equality. Arquette was born into an acting family that included siblings David, Roseanne, and Patricia, who famously memorialized her in a speech at the 2019 Emmy Awards. She chronicled her sex reassignment surgery in a 2007 documentary, Alexis Arquette, She's My Brother, but returned to presenting as a man in 2013 as her health failed. David Arquette said that Alexis was gender suspicious and alternately felt like a man or a woman at different times. She was diagnosed with HIV in 1989. Arquette was placed in a medically induced coma and died in September 2016. The Alexis Arquette Family Foundation, created by her family, works with the Los Angeles County plus USC Medical Center 
to provide medical and mental health support to LA's LGBTQ residents. Number 17, Tommy Sexton. A Canadian comedy legend who left us too soon, Thomas Tommy Sexton was a Canadian comedian. Born in St. John's, Newfoundland, he was the youngest member of the Codco comedy troupe. Educated in St. John's, he was an honor student before quitting after grade 10 to pursue an acting career in Toronto. After briefly working on a children's touring theater show, he landed his first television role in the drama series Police Surgeon. Sexton and colleague Diane Olson subsequently wrote Cod on a Stick, a comedic play which launched Cod Co. In 1975, Sexton took a brief sabbatical from Cod Co. to study at the Toronto Dance Theatre. He subsequently returned, working on other shows with Cod Co. and subsequently touring with colleagues Greg Malone in two co-written works, The Wonderful Grand Band and Too Foolish to Talk About. In 1985 and 1986, Sexton and Malone wrote and performed in a series of television specials for the CBC called the S&M Comic Book, which in turn led to Codco landing its own series in 1987. After Codco's run concluded in 1992, Sexton and Malone wrote and starred in a CBC television special, The National Doubt, satirizing the constitutional debates of the early 1990s. Sexton subsequently wrote a semi-autobiographical film, Adult Children of Alcoholics, the musical, which was a production in November 1993 when Sexton, who was openly gay, fell ill due to complications from AIDS. He died on December 13th of that year. Malone subsequently campaigned for HIV and AIDS education in Sexton's memory. His sister, filmmaker Mary Sexton, produced a documentary film about him, Tommy, a family portrait in 2001. Along with Malone and the Codco co-star Andy Jones, Sexton was a posthumous recipient of the Earl Grey Award, the Lifetime Achievement Award of Canadian Television's Gemini Awards in 2002. The Tommy Sexton Center, a new assisted housing complex for people living with HIV and AIDS, was opened in St. John's in 2006. In 2009, several drag queens in the city put together Ravishing in Red, a tribute show to Sexton as a fundraiser for the Sexton Center. Sexton's mother, Sarah Sexton, became a major figure in HIV AIDS awareness in Newfoundland and Labrador following her son's death. Sarah Sexton was announced as an inductee in the Order of Newfoundland and Labrador in 2013 and was inducted in February 2014. While you've been going down to the Legion every night, swilling back beer and coming home turning the house upside down, I've been upstairs in my room getting the Nobel Prize. We got the Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, eating pork chops with us. It's a $442,000 prize, Jerry. How did you do it? Number 16, Fela Kuti, an Afrobeat pioneer who battled political oppression and illness. Fela Kuti, also known as Fela, was a musical icon who is credited for founding Afrobeat, which mixes Nigerian music, Ghanaian music, jazz, funk, and other elements. But aside from being a hugely influential and talented musician, Fela was also a political activist who used his music to critique the Nigerian government and its lack of investment in the health and education of Nigerian people. Fela died in 1997 from Kaposi sarcoma. Many people living in Nigeria said that Fela's sharing his HIV status was akin to Magic Johnson sharing his HIV status in the United States. Number 15, Andy Bell, a synth pop icon who continues to inspire. Andrew Ivan Bell is an English singer and songwriter. He is best known as the lead vocalist of the synth-pop duo Erasure. The band achieved mainstream success, receiving a Brit Award for Best British Group, and are popular within the LGBT community, for whom the out and proud Bell has become an icon. Erasure have penned over 200 songs and have sold over 25 million albums worldwide. They have achieved five consecutive number ones on the UK Albums Chart. His singles include A Little Respect, Sometimes, and Always. 
Bell is known for his soulful voice and flamboyant stage persona, which contrasts with bandmate Vince Clark's low-key, deadpan demeanor. Just before Christmas 2004, the lead singer of the band, Erisher, said he and his boyfriend were HIV positive. He told HIV Plus magazine that he'd known for more than six years, but waited to talk about it because he didn't feel ready. His boyfriend and band's manager, Paul Hickey, wrote about their life with the virus in the book, Sometimes, A Life of Love, Loss, and Eshura. Hickey died in 2012. Number 14, Tom Fogarty a rock legend who lost his life after a tragic mistake. Fogarty and his brother John were founding members of the southern influence rock band Creedence Clearwater Revival. CCR is known for mega hits like Proud Mary, Born on the Bayou, Bad Moon Rising, and Fortunate Son. Unfortunately, the brothers had a falling out in the early 1970s, which was the beginning of the end for the band. Sadly, Fogarty's attempts at a solo career never saw the success that Creedence achieved. At some point in the 1980s, Fogarty underwent back surgery and was given a blood transfusion that was not screened for HIV. This caused him to become infected with the virus and subsequently resulted in his contraction of AIDS, alongside his ensuring complications with tuberculosis, all of which eventually led to his death on September 6, 1990. After his death, a music compilation titled The Very Best of Tom Fogarty was released. The brothers were never able to reconcile. Number 13, Elizabeth Glazier. A mother's fight turned into a movement for children. Glazier became a leading AIDS activist after she received an HIV-contaminated blood transfusion while giving birth to her daughter, Ariel. I'm Elizabeth Glazier. 11 years ago, while giving birth to my first child, I hemorrhaged and was transfused with seven pints of blood. Four years later, I found out that I had been infected with the AIDS virus and had unknowingly passed it to my daughter, Ariel, through my breast milk. Ariel later died after contracting the illness through breastfeeding, and Glazier's son, Jake, contracted it in utero. After Ariel's death in 1988, Glazier co-founded the Elizabeth Glazier Pediatric AIDS Foundation to raise awareness about HIV in children. At the time of Ariel's death, Glazier told the New York Times, she taught me to love when all I wanted to do was hate. She taught me to help others when all I wanted to do was help myself. Glazier died in 1994 of AIDS-related complications, but her legacy lives on. The foundation reached an estimated 20 million women worldwide, testing 17 million and enrolling more than 2.2 million in its HIV care and support program. Number 12, Ray Sharkey, a Hollywood star who hid his diagnosis until the end. Raymond Sharkey Jr., November 14, 1952 to June 11, 1993, was an American stage, film, and television actor. Yes, that is a very attractive offer. 5000 a week. <laughs> My own car, a suite at the hotel, and expense account. His most notable film role was that of Vincent Vaccari in the 1980 film The Idolmaker, for which he won the Golden Globe Award for Best Actor, Motion Picture Musical or Comedy. He is also known for his role as Sonny Steelgrave in the television series Wise Guy. In an interview with Details magazine conducted in March 1993, three months before his death, Starkey told the reporter that he was HIV positive by saying that he harbored a strain of HIV that he believed would never develop into AIDS. At the time of the interview, Starkey weighed 80 pounds, had a hacking cough, and was suffering from a brain lesion. Starkey died of complications from AIDS on June 11, 1993, at age 40. Number 11, Marlon Riggs, an activist and filmmaker whose work gave a voice to the marginalized. Marlon Troy Riggs was an American filmmaker, educator, professor, poet, and gay rights activist. He produced, wrote, and directed several documentary films, including Ethnic Notions, Tongues Untied, Color Assignment, and Black Is, Black Ain't. Never awaits me this much I know. I was blind to my brother's beauty, and now I see my own. 
deaf to the voice that believed we were worth wanting, loving each other. Now I hear. I was mute, tongue-tied. Riggs created a pathetically innovative and socially provocative film that examined past and present representations of race and sexuality in America. The Marlon Riggs collection is now housed at Stanford University Libraries. Marlon Riggs died in his home on April 5, 1994. Jack Vinson, his life partner, stated that the cause of death was due to complications from AIDS. Number 10, Willie Ninja. The godfather of voguing who brought ballroom culture to the world. William Roscoe Leake, better known as Willie Ninja, was an American dancer and choreographer best known for his appearance in the documentary film Paris is Burning. Ninja, a gay man known as the godfather of voguing, was a fixture of ball culture at Harlem's Drag Balls, who took inspiration from sources as far flung as Fred Astaire and the world of haute couture to develop a unique style of dance and movement. He caught the attention of Paris's burning director, Jenny Livingston, who featured Ninja prominently in the film. The film, a critical and box office success, served as a springboard for Ninja. He parlayed his appearance into performances with a number of dance troupes and choreography gigs. The film also documents the origins of voguing, a dance style in which competing ball walkers freeze and pose in glamorous positions, as if being photographed for the cover of Vogue magazine. In 1989, Ninja starred in a music video for Malcolm McLaren's song Deep in Vogue, which sampled the then unfinished movie and brought Ninja's style to the mainstream. One year after this, Madonna released her number one song, Vogue, bringing further attention to the dance style. Ninja died of AIDS-related heart failure in New York City on September 2, 2006. Number 9. Denholm Elliott A distinguished actor with a secret struggle. Denholm Elliott, a British actor known for his diverse and emotionally charged performances, secured his legacy as one of the most accomplished figures in the world of stage and screen. Born on May 31, 1922 in Ealing, London, Elliott's career spanned more than five decades, during which he demonstrated his exceptional versatility by embodying a wide array of characters across genres. Elliott's journey to stardom was not without obstacles. After serving as a radio operator in the Royal Air Force during World War II, he was captured by the Germans and spent several years as a prisoner of war. Upon his return to England, Elliot turned to acting as a means of coping with his experiences. After studying at the prestigious Royal Academy of Dramatic Art, he took the theater world by storm, winning acclaim for his roles in plays like The Cocktail Party and Waiting for Godot. His talent didn't go unnoticed in Hollywood either, as he landed significant roles in films such as Indiana Jones, Raiders of the Lost Ark, A Room with a View, and Trading Places garnering widespread appreciation and several award nominations. Despite his success, Elliot's personal life was marked with hardship and tragedy. He battled alcoholism and tuberculosis and grappled with the loss of his daughter Jennifer, who died from a drug overdose. Despite these challenges, his enduring spirit and love for acting never waned, enabling him to deliver powerful performances until his death on October 6, 1992, of AIDS-related tuberculosis. Denholm Elliott's contribution to the world of theater and film remains etched in cinematic history, underscoring his status as a timeless icon of the performing arts. Number 8. Michael Callan A trailblazer in AIDS activism and education. Michael Callan, April 11, 1955 to December 27, 1993, was an American singer, songwriter, composer, author, and AIDS activist. Callan was diagnosed with AIDS in 1982 and became a pioneer of AIDS activism in New York City, working closely with his doctors, Dr. Joseph Sonnabin and Richard Berkowitz. I am a 27-year-old gay man with AIDS, and I have been asked to talk about the volatile issue of promiscuity. Promiscuity is a vague word which means different things to different people. Together, they published articles and pamphlets to raise awareness about the correlation between risky sexual behaviors and AIDS. As a major contributor to the foundation of AIDS activism, specifically activism from people with AIDS, Callan helped draft unprecedented documents such as How to Have Sex in an Epidemic, One Approach, and the Denver Principles. 
In addition to his written work, Callan was a leader and founder of activist organizations, including the People with AIDS Coalition and the Community Research Initiative. As a musician, he was a member of the openly gay and politically active a cappella quintet, The Flirtations, and released his own solo album, Purple Heart, in 1988. He consistently spoke out for AIDS activists and gay and lesbian organizations and made frequent speaking appearances. Callan remained a primary public figure in AIDS activism until he died at age 38 from AIDS-related complication of pulmonary Kaposi's sarcoma at Midway Hospital in Los Angeles, California. Number 7. Perry Ellis A fashion designer whose legacy was clouded by stigma. Ellis is best known for his casual American style of sportswear. His use of khakis, hand-knitted sweaters, and oversized jackets led the New York Times to proclaim that he glorified the clean-cut all-American look. At the time, his cause of death was listed as viral encephalitis, but rumors of Ellis's HIV-positive status made news after it came to light that his lover and business partner, Laughlin Barker, died of Kaposi's sarcoma and AIDS-related cancer. The Los Angeles Times ran a 1986 series on journalistic ethics and whether it was appropriate to include AIDS rumors in news stories, with Ellis serving as the focus. Ellis continued to deny that he was sick, but rumors of his illness persisted after he passed out at the receiving line at a party at the Costume Institute in December 1985. On January 2, 1986, Barker died of lung cancer at the couple's home in Manhattan. After Barker's death, Ellis's health rapidly declined. By May 1986, Ellis had contracted viral encephalitis, which caused paralysis on one side of his face. Despite his appearance, he insisted on appearing at his fall fashion show, held in New York City on May 8. At the end of the show, Ellis attempted to walk the runway for his final bow, but was so weak he had to be supported by two assistants. It was his final public appearance. Ellis was hospitalized soon after and slipped into a coma. He died of viral encephalitis on May 30, 1986. A spokesperson for Ellis's company would not comment on whether the designer's death was AIDS-related, stating those were Perry's wishes. Number 6. Tommy Morrison A heavyweight boxer whose denial of his diagnosis cost him dearly. Heavyweight boxer and Rocky V star Tommy Morrison was diagnosed with HIV in 1996. But though he initially went on medication and sought counsel with other people living with HIV, Morrison eventually fell prey to AIDS denialism and began to doubt his status. In 2006, Morrison said his HIV test had been false positives. Morrison tested negative for HIV four times in January 2007. On July 22, 2007, the New York Times reported that Morrison took two HIV tests in 2007 and a third specifically for the Times. Ringside doctors, including Nevada's chief ringside physician, implied that the negative results were not based on Morrison's blood. In August 2013, Morrison's mother, Diana, said that Tommy had full-blown AIDS and was in his final days. She also stated that Morrison had been bedridden for over a year. Morrison's wife, Tricia, allegedly did not believe Morrison had AIDS. Number 5. Liberace a larger-than-life entertainer who was consumed by a secret, Bellagio Valentino Liberace was an American pianist, singer, and actor. He was born in Wisconsin to parents of Italian and Polish origin and enjoyed a career spanning four decades of concerts, recordings, television, motion pictures, and endorsements. At the height of his fame from the 1950s to the 1970s, he was the highest paid entertainer in the world with established concert residencies in Las Vegas and an international touring schedule. The famed penis was known for his over-the-top performances, costumes, and piano top candelabra. He embraced a lifestyle of flamboyant excess, both on and off stage. Liberace denied claims he was gay, suing both the London tabloid Daily Mirror in 1956 and his chauffeur and secretary Scott Thorson, who sued for palimony in 1982. When he died in February 1987, his lawyer, manager, and publicist denied he had AIDS. The cause of death was listed as heart failure, 
but an autopsy showed he had AIDS and died from pneumonia. We're living in such a permissive world that I don't think anybody really much cares what anybody does behind closed doors. It's not shocking anymore. Number four, Timothy Patrick Murphy. A soap opera heartthrob gone too soon. Timothy Patrick Murphy was an American actor, perhaps best known for his role as Mickey Trotter on the popular CBS primetime soap opera Dallas from 1982 to 83. Murphy was gay and had a romantic relationship with actor Mark Patton during the 1980s. Murphy died of AIDS on December 6, 1988 in Sherman Oaks, California at age 29 and was buried at the Forest Lawn Hollywood Hills Cemetery in Los Angeles. His younger brother, actor Patrick Sean Murphy, was killed in the North Tower of the World Trade Center during the attacks of September 11, 2001. Number 3. Paul Shinar a talented actor whose role in Scarface became iconic. My teeth shall tear the slavish motive of recanting fear and spit it, bleeding in his high disgrace where shame doth harbor, even in Mowbray's fate. Albert Paul Shinar was an American actor and theater director known for portraying the Bolivian drug lord Alejandro Sosa in Scarface 1983. A veteran Broadway and Shakespearean actor, he was one of the 27 founding members of the American Conservatory Theater. Chenard was gay and was romantically involved with British actor Jeremy Brett during the 1970s. They were in a relationship that reportedly lasted from 1973 to 1978. After the couple separated, they remained close friends until Chenard's death in 1989. In 1983, Chenard was diagnosed with AIDS. He died from the disease on October 11, 1989. He was 53 years old. Number 2. Charles Ludlam A theater revolutionary whose life was cut short. Charles Braun Ludlam was an American actor, director, and playwright. Ludlam was diagnosed with AIDS in March 1987. He attempted to fight the disease with his lifelong interest in healthy eating and a microbiotic diet, but died a month after his AIDS diagnosis of PCP pneumonia in St. Vincent's Hospital. His front page obituary in the New York Times was the newspaper's first page one obituary to specifically name AIDS as the cause of death, with Ludlum's parents' consent, instead of the AIDS-related illnesses such as pneumonia commonly cited at the time. Number 1. Rock Hudson The first Hollywood megastar to bring AIDS into the public eye. Rock Hudson, born as Roy Harold Shearer Jr. in Winnica, Illinois, on November 17, 1925, was one of the most popular and well-known American actors of his time. He began his acting career in Hollywood in the late 1940s after serving in the U.S. Navy during World War II. Despite facing initial rejections due to his inexperience, Huston's persistence eventually led him to Universal Pictures, where he was given a new name and image, thus beginning the transformation into the charming leading man known and loved by audiences worldwide. Hudson's breakthrough role came in the 1954 film Magnificent Obsession, which established him as a romantic lead. His performance in Giant, 1956, alongside Elizabeth Taylor and James Dean, earned him an Academy Award nomination for Best Actor, cementing his status among Hollywood elite. Throughout the 1960s, Hudson continued his success with a series of romantic comedies with Doris Day, including hits like Pillow Talk, 1959, and Lover Come Back, 1961. These films showcase his comedic timing and versatility as an actor, further expanding his appeal. Off-screen, Hudson's life was marked by personal struggles and secrecy. In a time when homosexuality was stigmatized and concealed, Hudson was forced to hide his sexual orientation. It wasn't until near the end of his life that he publicly acknowledged being gay, becoming one of the first major celebrities to do so. His subsequent battle with AIDS and his decision to disclose his diagnosis brought much needed attention to the disease. Rock Hudson passed away on October 2, 1985, leaving behind a legacy of iconic performances and a significant impact on the visibility of the LGBTQ community in Hollywood. Thanks for watching. If these stories moved you, 
don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe for more deep dives into the lives of your favorite celebrities. And hey, why stop here? Check out our other videos for more fascinating stories about Hollywood's hidden secrets and untold tales. See you in the next one.